Welcome to another session of the NPTEL on Nonlinear and Adaptive Control. I am Srikant Sukumar from Systems and Control IIT Bombay. You folks can again see this very nice representative background image that uh, has been ubiquitous in our course. Uh, this is sort of uh, uh, amalgamation of sensors, robotics, actuation and algorithms, uh, the sort of algorithms which we choose to, I mean, seek to design that will drive autonomous uh, rovers such as these on Mars and Moon and so on and so forth. All right. So without further ado, we go into our lectures. So. Until last time, we had sort of uh, looked at an introduction of uh, adaptive control. We sort of saw what these, uh, you know, building blocks mean. You know, there's a state space model block, there is a controller block, but in addition, there is also an adaptive control block, right? So the purpose of this adaptive control block was to estimate these unknown parameters in the system. All right. So now as we move forward, uh, one of the things that we sort of need to remember is that the purpose of uh, uh, or, or a lot of what we do in adaptive control and nonlinear control in general is uh, uh, this asymptotic analysis. All right. So that is we sort of try to see uh, what happens. Um, as time goes to infinity to different signals and functions and so on and so forth all right so this is one of the key aspects of uh, what we are going to do um, as we move further along in this course right now there are a few pitfalls in this um, sort of uh, journey of ours now one of the uh, you know first few pitfalls is regarding you know what happens to the convergence of functions and correspondingly what happens to the convergence of its derivatives all right so this is what we want to address first today in this lecture so suppose i consider a, a function right and let's see if i consider a function and uh, i have this knowledge that as t goes to infinity the function converges to a constant right so suppose i know that the function converges to a constant as t goes to infinity right this is what we are talking about then this does not automatically imply that the derivative of the function goes to zero right i mean intuitively we sort of assume that yeah this should be true that you know a function is converging to a constant then the derivative goes to zero if a function goes to zero the derivative goes to zero all of this somehow seems to make sense in our minds right but this is not true this is one of the first pitfalls so we quote a counter example right i mean i mean of course there are many many counter examples possible we quote one of them right and what is it uh, suppose i take the function which is sine t squared divided by t right and uh, Suppose I take the limit of this function as t goes to infinity. Let's look carefully at what happens, right? The numerator right, keeps oscillating between minus one and one. It does not matter what happens to time and you know how much time has lapsed. Yeah, if I plug in something like an infinity or a very, very large number here, it doesn't matter. Sine of t square is still going to oscillate between minus one and one, all right? So this is, you know, uh, not really reaching a limit. However, the denominator is going to go to infinity right as t becomes really really large the denominator is going to become very very large right and therefore it's obvious that the denominator is becoming very large while the numerator is anything between minus one to one so it doesn't matter what happens to the numerator as i take a limit as t goes to infinity we get zero all right so we get a we get that our function converges to a constant which is zero all right so this is you know 
what uh, it is one of the things that we need to remember right now let's look at the derivative of this function right so what is the derivative i mean it's very standard we just computed using the chain rule and the product rule yeah so the first piece here is the derivative corresponding to the 1 over t term here all right and the second term here is the derivative corresponding to the numerator it's very easy to compute i mean i really encourage you to do this computation by yourself not to believe me right then what happens now we look at what happens to each of the term if i take a limit on both sides right what happens now if i if i look at the first term again it starts to look very much like this term right i mean i mean there is a sine t squared minus sine t squared which is again oscillating right so it's something between plus minus one but the denominator is again going to go to infinity in fact faster than the one by t right which means that this term right is definitely going to go to zero all right so this term is definitely going to go to zero no problem right what happens to the second term though what we note is that the second term now does not contain anything in the denominator it's only a trigonometric function that is a cosine t squared in the numerator all right which is not so great anymore right uh, because now i know that the cosine t square is just going to keep oscillating and not reach a limit at all right and this is something which you know should bother us to be honest yeah because honestly speaking this function is not that is f dot of t in fact will not have any limit as t goes to infinity all right so the derivative of the function has no limit as t goes to infinity yeah so this whatever seemingly counterintuitive thing has come true uh, that that though the function itself converges to a constant zero in this case the derivative does not really converge to anything at all all right and this is should be baffling for us all right the important thing to notice is that we did not really take any very badly behaved function you know it's not a non-smooth function it's not a you know discontinuous function or anything like that except at t equal to zero right the function is in fact c infinity right what is c infinity c infinity means infinitely times continuously differentiable all right so this is infinitely times continuously differentiable except at t equal to zero for those who have never seen this notation c infinity i strongly encourage you to look up this notation all right make sure you familiarize yourself with it because this notation um, is definitely going to show up regularly in our course all right so the important thing to note is we did not choose any poorly behaved function to sort of prove our you know thesis that the function converging to a constant does not mean the derivative converges to a zero all right we picked a relatively nice function okay so the derivative in fact continues to oscillate between minus 2 and 2 all right so that's what we say here right so the derivative doesn't go to 0 but it oscillates between minus 2 and 2 all right so the converse also does not hold true interestingly all right so what's the converse the converse is that if the derivative goes to 0 right can we say that the function itself is going to go to a constant all right so this is again another important question yeah what is the question if the derivative goes to zero is the function itself going to go to a constant we again present our hypothesis and say that no this is not true and again we present some counter example yeah please ignore this i have deliberately cancelled this because this is erroneous this is wrong right but look at this example right here if i take a function f of t which is log of t logarithm of t then the derivative is 1 over t yeah we all know what is the derivative of the logarithmic function right simply 1 over t all right and we know very well that if i take the limit as t goes to infinity for f dot of t then it's zero right because the t goes to the denominator goes to infinity and therefore the limit is zero Right. on the other hand if i take the limit of f of t right bad things happen yeah because t goes to infinity and logarithm of course goes to infinity maybe slower than t but still it does go to infinity right so therefore limit of f of t is in fact infinity right wow that's bad all right in fact it's not a bounded function at all 
however the derivative is actually going to go to zero right again if you note this function is nicely behaved everywhere except at the origin yeah except at the origin this function is nicely behaved right so remember that we are only uh, sort of interested in the behavior at least as far as asymptotic analysis is concerned at infinity right? that is at very very large time yeah so we are not really interested in small time behavior right so therefore the function uh, not being well defined at the origin and so on should not matter so much i can always tweak the function so that it's well behaved at the origin and everything goes through i mean how would i do that very simple I will, you know, say make this instead of log t, I'll make log t plus one, right? And now the function's derivative is one over t plus one, right? And I still have the exact same result. That is one over t plus one goes to zero as t goes to infinity. Log t plus one blows up as t goes to infinity, right? In fact, this is now very well behaved. I mean, very well behaved at the origin. And since the time is always considered to be non-negative, that it starts at zero, so I have no problem. This is a very valid, nice function in the domain of my interest, right? So I have a very nice function f of t, nicely behaved at the origin and everywhere else beyond t t equal to zero, and still it does not satisfy this um, sort of intuitive idea maybe that if the derivative converges to zero then the function itself converges to a constant okay so i really want all of you to drive this notion out of your minds that if you have a derivative converging to zero then the function goes to a constant and vice versa that if the function is converging to a constant then the derivative goes to zero right where this lacunae happens is because we are not looking at the function itself Right. We are not really looking at the function itself. We are looking at the de uh, at the limit of a function. Okay, we are not saying that the function is a constant. It's obvious that if the function is a constant, the derivative is zero, and vice versa. That's obvious. But we are not saying that. We are saying that if the function converges to a constant, right? So the limit in these, you know, I mean, in in, in, in all our uh, discussion, this limit is what somehow. Um, messes up things for you okay so this is very critical please keep this in mind all right all right so i really strongly strongly encourage all of you to come up with more counter examples i know you can yeah so give it a shot uh, just take hints from what i have done the more you sort of come up with counter examples the more you will convince yourself and also actually develop the habit of coming up with counter examples yeah in applied mathematics and mathematics, uh, coming up with counter examples is one of the most uh, challenging things. You know, uh, uh, most mathematicians, a lot of mathematicians actually write papers out of coming up with counter examples of some other result that somebody seems to have proven just to claim that, yeah, that result is probably not correct. Yeah. So, yeah, you can actually make a business out of coming up with counter examples. Yeah. So, it's an interesting exercise. Just I, I really uh, would recommend that all of you try to come up with these counter examples. All right. All right. Once we um, have sort of understood, not understood, but we have sort of gotten rid of some myths, some temptations in asymptotic analysis, we come to the next important set of notions that um, are really, really critical to uh, what we want to study. Okay. Yeah. And what is this? These are the notions of norms. All right. Uh, there are two things we are really interested in. One is that the fact that we do asymptotic analysis uh, means that limits and convergence and these notions become really important for us. And second is because we are always dealing with vectors, uh, signals, vectors and signals, because all the states, all the control outputs, everything is a vector. Yeah, so we are always working in some kind of a vector space, at least for the purposes of this course, these are vector spaces. Yeah, there may be other more complicated structures in other courses, but right in this course, we are dealing with vector spaces and hence all the objects that we are dealing with are also vectors. All right. Since we have vectors and then we have matrices which are operating on these vectors, uh, it is important for us to sort of have a measure of the size of these vectors 
yeah because we eventually want a lot of these vectors to go to zero right um, or we want one vector to dominate another vector so to actually have a sense of how these notions can be created like in real numbers it's very easy to say that 3 is greater than 2 right but if i give you a vector for example if i just said you know i have a vector 3 1 and minus 1 5 right can you tell me which one is greater than which one is less than the other right there is no obvious way right there is no obvious way of doing these things so norms actually gives you uh, one such obvious way because it reduces any vector to a scalar yeah i'm not saying that this is the way yeah but this is an particular way and this in fact um, gives us a lot of lot of uh, ability to do a lot of mathematics with vector spaces yeah so uh, like i said well i did not say it yet but the norm is is essentially a measure of length yeah in a vector space a norm is a measure of length in a vector space yeah so keep this in mind um but of course we have a more formal definition of what a norm is so norm is a function in our case from rn to r yeah, so we are keeping it a little bit simple so we are only working with real vector space right? so norm is a function from rn to r yeah and uh, it's a valid norm if it's non-negative right so this is the notation the two vertical brackets this is the notation right get used to this if you've not seen this before i would expect most of you have seen some version of this yeah but all right so the first property that is is that it is non-negative the second is that it's zero only if the vector itself is the zero vector okay the third is the scalar multiplication property that is the norm of alpha x is actually equal to mod of alpha times norm of x for any scalar alpha and the final and the probably the most critical property is the triangle inequality which is that norm of x plus y is less than or equal to norm x plus norm y okay so so these are the standard properties for norms any function that you can come up with that maps from rn that is your vector space to real numbers to scalars yeah with these properties will be a norm a valid norm okay will be a valid norm now what are examples of a valid norm one is the i mean the commonly used norms are the infinity norm right which is just the maximum of all the elements okay so if you just take the max of all the elements of a vector then you have the infinity norm for the vector and then you have the p norm okay the, what's the p norm the p norm is simply taking the absolute value to the power p of each component summing them up and then taking the pth root okay so that is what is the p norm okay now i'm going to go forward and then back again yeah so so these are you know rather uh, important notions and these are rather important norms okay so if for example if i take a vector say something like this right what is that uh, this is essentially a vector x in r4 all right which is 3 2 7 5 so it's four elements r4 right now suppose i want to compute these norms right so what will be the infinity norm infinity norm is just the largest component yeah so it should be obvious to you that this is the largest component therefore the infinity norm is 7 right what about some p norms right there are some useful p norms right the two norm is actually the euclidean distance like i said yeah what you all of you are used to in measuring distance is the euclidean distance is the actually the two norm how do you compute it you take the absolute value of every element well i mean the example i've chosen everything is positive so absolute value does not change anything i take the pth power that is the squared in this case and then i take a sum and then i take a square root all right so i have not actually shown what the answer is but it should be pretty straightforward for you to compute okay uh, finally what is the one norm the one norm is again very similar to compute you take the absolute value add them up take the first root which is basically do nothing and then you get the answer 3 plus 2 plus 7 plus 5 which is just 17 
all right okay so this is uh, some uh, key vector norms all right and these are uh, sort of some of the ideas yeah these are some of the examples uh, of norms that you have um, that will be very useful as we go forward okay we also have the notion of a matrix induced norm so like i said we have vectors right and then we have matrices right so we since we have both uh, vectors and then matrices which operate on these vectors yeah we will see how don't worry about it now but the point is we also have to define a norm so the way we do this is that we uh, use the vector norm itself to somehow generate a matrix norm okay so this is again something uh, um, very normal in mathematics is that whenever you want to uh, solve a new problem you try to uh, get motivated by a previous problem that has already been solved or a simpler problem that's already been solved yeah so here we already have the notion of a vector norm right so a typical mathematician would think yeah why not use the vector norm itself to generate a matrix norm yeah smart yeah so what is it so how do i do that so the the matrix induced norm that's why it's called the induced norm because it's induced by a vector norm is simply uh, measuring a maximum magnification of a vector of any vector by a matrix okay so that's why you see this definition it says it's supremum which is a generalization of the maximum okay so the supremum is a generalization of the maximum right and and, and so it's taking the supremum over all x in rn right so it's the supremum over all possible vectors right and the numerator is the norm of ax and the denominator is norm of x right so it's somehow measuring the magnification due to the matrix a of all possible vect vectors in the vector space okay so so uh, it should it's also important to notice that uh, this matrix a is not a square matrix right not necessarily a square matrix you can define a norm for any matrix it doesn't have to be a square matrix right now the interesting thing to note is that the numerator is therefore a different sized vector and the denominator is a different sized vector but only because of the norm right again you should sort of become conversant with the power of the norm right only because of the norm you are able to uh, sort of compare vectors in two different vector spaces right because r2 and r4 for example are two different vector spaces but just because you have this norm operation you are able to compare the two okay all right so if you know if you have some idea of you know eigen values and eigen vectors you can make some guesses as to you know uh, what will be the maximum magnification and things like that all right so uh, i would leave you to uh, say to try to figure out what would be this maximum magnification of a matrix right i mean so the important thing to note is that uh, this uh, depending on what norm vector norm i choose here right so if i put a p here and a p here i get a corresponding p matrix norm okay so depending on what vector norm i use of course i have to use the same vector norm in the numerator and denominator then i get a corresponding p induced norm all right it's as simple as that okay so now uh, before sort of discussing what is the supremum and so on and so forth um, we sort of want to want to understand what is the structure that is given to a vector space by a norm all right so this is uh, something that is critical right there's something that is very critical so um, i'm of course assuming that all of you have seen uh, vector spaces or some variant of it all right um, if you've not again this is something that you uh, really uh, should see in a linear systems course like with a state space linear systems course right um, because whenever we talk linear systems we are saying that the system itself is evolving on a vector space right the idea the notion is the idea of spaces subspaces planes and so on planes and subplanes right hyperplanes yeah so that's vector spaces is essentially uh, generalization of these hyperplanes right so um, so these are spaces where uh, superposition principle is satisfied okay so again i am 
being very vague about it yeah but i would expect that all of you do know what is a vector space yeah because otherwise you do not follow what is a no normed linear space right whenever i say linear space linear space and vector space are identical yeah linear space linear vector space vector space these are used uh, almost analogously yeah so what is a normed linear space yeah so a normed linear space is essentially a linear vector space with an associated norm okay that's it if you have a vector space or a linear space or a linear vector space like i said and you have a norm on it then the two together denoted as x comma this norm form a normed linear space yeah okay now the good thing is most of the spaces we are working with which is rks rps and so on and so forth they are all uh, normed linear spaces right so basically any rn with any of the aforementioned vector norms right that is the x infinity x1 x2 that is rn with in, in nor infinity norm rn with one norm rn with two norm these are all normed linear spaces okay so just the fact that you're able to define a norm in this space makes it a normed linear space all right so remember this yeah so this is a, a rather nice set of notions okay um, the notion of a normed linear space we will uh, continue to use this on a regular basis yeah so again so what is it that we are looking at is uh, some notions on you know on sort of pitfalls in asymptotic analysis that we want to avoid yeah that's the first set of things that we did look at today uh, the next a uh, set of ideas is on the fact that we want to deal with vectors because states controls outputs everything are vectors right and we want to look at uh, sizes of these yeah we want to look at what happens to the sizes of these vectors as time evolves right so therefore in order to in order to sort of make sense of all these notions and compare two vectors if you want to right we um, define vector norms matrix norms also are something which are very critical because these matrices will eventually operate on these vectors right and we want to sort of assess how this operation affects the vector so therefore we have taken the liberty of defining a matrix norm using a vector norm and this is called the induced norm right and this matrix induced norm also has some nice properties which we will look at next time and then we also saw that these norms on a vector space in fact give us uh, rather nice structure i mean as of now we are simply making definitions out of it yeah but the fact that you have a norm linear space is a rather um, serious object that you have all right i mean it's a serious amount of structure that you have in this space yeah first of all you already have a vector space which is you know linear in the sense that you are in hyperplanes and there is a superposition principle that is followed on top of it you have a notion of a distance on this vector space yeah which becomes really really useful in all sorts of analysis all sorts of mathematical analysis that we are uh, very very keen on exploring right uh, even the matrix induced norm is the norm that we have developed for the matrix also makes the space of matrices a normed linear space okay we don't discuss it at this stage but yeah i mean this is an additional tidbit for you if you may that these uh, norms that have we have defined for the matrix that is the matrix induced norm also makes the mat a space of matrices for example r n by n matrix along with the induced norm also gives you a normed linear space all right all right with that we will stop